Welcome to Civic Cocktail here on Seattle Channel, presented by City Club and Crosscut. I'm your host, Brian Callahan. A big thanks to the support of the Whitman Institute for making this show happen. We are talking about a great show, what we call Civic Conversation with a Twist. And one of the nicest twists we have is the place where we're having this, one of the nicest venues in Seattle. We, of course, are talking about the Palace Ballroom here in downtown Seattle. Tom Douglas, of course, has a great place here. We have a beautiful crowd. Give yourselves a round of applause, would you, a beautiful crowd? Okay, all right, well done, well done. Now, as the name Civic Cocktail might suggest, we are mixing up a few ingredients here in terms of the different topics that we're going to be discussing here this evening. The two topics that we're talking about, transportation at the local and state level, and also the arts. Two issues that really speak to how livable our community is, and also two issues that intersect a little bit more than you might think. So here to help us break this down, we have a lovely and talented panel right here. Peter Hahn, let me introduce you to him. He's the director of the Seattle Department of Transportation. Let's give him a big round of applause, please. All right. We also have with us Mary Bruno, Crosscuts Editor-in-Chief. Thank you for being here, Mary. All right. Leah Baltus is here as well. She is Editor-in-Chief for City Arts Magazine. Good to see you. Give her a round of applause if you would. And rounding out the panel, we have Marcy Silman, reporter for KUOW 94.9 FM, News and Information, and Marcy Silman. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's not in the promo, but it should be. All right, Marcy, thanks a ton for being here. So here's a little bit about how this show works. We'll take in a few questions from the audience. We have been taking them in before the camera started rolling. I have a few of them here. We're also tracking questions via social media. My iPad's around here somewhere. I'll be tracking those down as the show goes on here. But we really want to make sure that we hear your voice. Anyone in the crowd with a question, I'll be running around with a microphone. We have some volunteers with microphones as well to hear from everybody who's out here. And I want to make sure we reiterate this. We have a great panel with a lot of expertise. We have a great audience too with a lot to say here so we'll make sure that we interact with the audience think about what you're hearing folks think about what it means to you think about some next steps ways we can react to it and we'll work on it that way all right so I think I've covered just about everything everyone got it everyone got what we're doing here yeah. let's get the party started with civic cocktail give yourselves one more round of applause would you all right okay Okay, to set the stage, Peter, I want uh, your help in making this connection between transportation and the arts. So, Seattle, 40 years ago, this year as a matter of fact, was one of the first cities in the U.S. to pass a 1% for art ordinance, 1973. Basically, 1% 1 of the budget of any big building project in the city goes to public art. The big question here is why? When we've got potholes to fill, a backlog of sidewalks, roads to repair, why does that make sense to make that investment? I think that we all believe that when you have uh, transportation occupy 10 percent, excuse me, 10 square miles, which is 25 percent of the city's land area, it's something that we experience every day, everywhere we are, whether we are walking, whether we're just looking, whether we're getting anywhere. And so I think we want that experience to be enriching. I think we want that experience to be uh, inspiring and I think there's more to life than just getting from A to B okay I think it's the journey okay it's the richness of the journey okay okay thank you for that I know you have a, an arts background that we'll touch on a little bit later but I appreciate that to set us up here uh, Mary let me ask you this question too uh, from a different f different perspective we have a very strong arts economy here in the Seattle area the nonprofit uh, arts and culture industry nearly a half billion dollars in economic activity last year providing more than 10,000 jobs I lay that out there because Funding the arts has always been a challenge. I know it's been a challenge for transportation too, but I want to talk about this. Do you think these are two competing interests, making Seattle a better place for transit, for transportation, making Seattle a better place for the arts? What do you think about that? They are competing interests, mm. um, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, you know, you could argue that every dollar spent on art is a dollar that isn't spent on transportation mm. or energy policy or, or something else. Um, but having said that, I think that the arts in Seattle it, it is such a, an interesting, surprising experience. Like when I first moved here, I remember uh, my, the funnest thing was walking on Broadway and seeing the dancing steps. <laughs> yeah. it, it was just this sort of serendipitous encounter with something arty that was surprising and, and interesting and it made me curious about the arts. And that's the thing I love about Seattle. I mean, you don't have to go to the theater necessarily. You don't have to go to the ballet. You can encounter art anywhere. Uh, so, so I think that um, it would be very cool 
if transportation had the same kind of designated funding as, as the arts does. Mm. Um, but I don't think the two should be mutually exclusive. Okay, okay. A lot of different issues to cover here. I'm going to see if we have anything out in the crowd. Anyone got a hand up with a thought just yet? Still warming up? Get warm, folks, because we've got a lot of questions we've got to get to here. We did get a couple of questions coming in via Twitter. I'm going to check on those right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, that'll be coming in in just a second here. Uh, before I do that, I'll get one of the other questions that we came in, that we had come in from the crowd. Oh, here it is. All right. Got a new follower on Twitter. Well, that's good to know. Uh, let's figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Civic cocktails coming your way, too. Looks like we're still waiting for those messages to come in. But as those messages come in, let me throw out another question to you guys, and we'll get some more questions from the crowd here when they get warmed up. I want to talk a little bit about arts in education. And Leah, maybe I can draw you in on this. I know the Seattle Public School District is really working on this, trying to figure out some different ways to involve arts in K through 12 education. A bit of a challenge there as well, but I think some good news. You recently had a piece in your magazine talking about this and just how crucial it is that we have arts education in the Seattle area. Let me know about that. Why is it so crucial in your estimation? Well, it's mainly a, a way to learn, you know, there's a, a way of engaging students and kids in all kinds of different topics that aren't just about teaching kids how to read music or uh, sing in the choir or play an instrument or even dance, but that those kinds of uh, subjects can actually teach you math. There's a really uh, great part of that story that talks about uh, a classroom where the kids were learning fractions um, by learning how to count out a choreography piece and, and that's the kind of thing that works and the kids were super excited and uh, really engaged. They've been looking forward to their fractions lesson for a week. Um, <laughs> so you know that just shows arts as the how you know it's, it's more of a, a, a means than just necessarily an end. Okay. And uh, well, I was just going to say there's more to it than that because it's also a social justice issue. Um, all the studies show that uh, we want to foster creative thinking, and the thing that helps foster creative thinking, creative problem solving, is arts, uh, science as well. But arts really put kids on that path, and a lot of the schools in the Seattle district. You can look, there's money raised by PTAs in some of the wealthier neighborhoods to supplement, and some of the, the schools that are located in poor neighborhoods don't have that same opportunity right. or that same access to arts education. They're learning the creative thinking, they're learning the collaboration and teamwork, right. and uh, even empathy is a piece of that where, you know, through arts, kids learn how to relate to one another and care about one another and care about what they're doing and, and have risk and be allowed to fail. And and that's okay. And without those kinds of experiences, then they can't possibly develop in the same way. Yeah. I, I think that one of the challenges is, and I'll jump in while someone has a question. And let me throw this in before I get to you, sir. I wanted to ask about this whole concept of involving arts and education. I think there's a difficulty there just in measuring the impact of that. We measure so many things with map testing. I know a lot of people are big fans of that uh, around our area here. But in talking about this, I think measuring that piece there, measuring how that arts education actually impacts students, impacts test scores for that matter, that's difficult. And is that the disconnect there in terms of getting the proper funding for this? I think there has been a disconnect historically where that problem has come up, but I think that it's starting to get resolved because researchers are recognizing various correlations in terms of, you know, graduation rates, in terms of discipline issues, in terms of even test scores and that kind of stuff, and whether or not kids are getting the arts education makes a difference in how they do by those measures. Okay, okay, great. Well, there's also yeah. neurological research that's making direct connections between arts education and brain development, or lack thereof, okay. so at the University of Washington. Okay, so. all right, Marcy, thank you for that. Let me jump over here. Edwin had a question. Pardon me, excuse me. I'll, I'll hold on to this, Edwin, okay, thanks. Great. Yep, go ahead. Actually, more of a, another comment, another example. Um, several years ago, I was involved in a project, which I believe is still going on, funded by OSPI, called Teen Aware. Okay. And it's an elective project where kids, high school kids, choose to do a media project on teenage pregnancy. I worked with some kids in an inner city school in Tacoma who I was called in, I was at 911 Media Arts on their board. And anyway, they needed resources because they had none. Mm -hmm. But the teacher and school, school nurse was really committed to supporting this. We were all kind of on the same page because we believed in what these kids wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, they put together a music video mm -hmm. that none of them had ever done this before. Yeah. Highly creative project, which 
was all about teens talking to teens about this whole issue. It was incredibly successful for them. Okay. So we're talking like um, Lincoln High, I mean a major yeah. impoverished inner city school. Sure. The teacher was really a go-getter. He entered it in a state competition. They won. Mm. They won a national competition. Mm. The school ended up with funding for a permanent video center. Mm. And all of these kids had this experience of creating something that they would have never had a shot at before, mm. as well as you know, engaging in a topic which was a critical one. In fact, that program has been really successful um, because guess what? Kids are more prone to listen to one another than they are to an adult saying, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Give it up for Edwin. Great program there. Appreciate that comment, sir. Anybody else with a thought out here? Jill, I'm going to step out of your way so we can what, see you. Or, yeah. or not. Yeah, no, please. Uh, 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 so I want to see if we could acknowledge that what makes, what kind of distinguishes both transit and arts in a community is that they're electives. Mm. A community has to actually make a commitment it's not public safety. It's not, it doesn't reach the same level of urgency that some other public issues do. And I feel like that's one of the connectors between these two topics. And I wonder if you guys could address that. What does it say about us as a community if we put arts forward? If we say public transportation is a priority for our community, why is it a, is it a priority? Why are arts a priority? What does it say about us? OK, thank you very much for that, Jill. Peter, you want to take a stab at that? Well, I think uh, all of us would feel that our quality of life uh, will be severely degraded if, for example, our transit company called Metro were to lose 17% uh, of its revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think we would immediately feel the impact of that. Yeah. And I think Metro has made a very good case that that would be a calamity and that we need to do something about it. And I think we would argue, I would argue from a transportation point of view, that that's absolutely essential if our city is to continue being a premier city in the country, which it is. And I think we, we, we have daily examples of why companies come here, why people come here, why Amazon chose to be here and not in the suburbs. And I think transit is a key part of it. The ability to walk to work is a part of it. And I think uh, it, what it says about us is that we want to make the kinds of choices in transportation that help carbon neutrality, that help us do submissions, and that preserve our incredible environment and Puget Sound. Thank you very much for that. And Peter, can you tell us a little bit about your arts background too? Because I know it's, uh, it's not really uh, something you need to write on the resume there when you're applying for a DOT job. But uh, uh, l let us know a little bit about your arts background, if you would, sir. <laughs> so uh, I actually went to art school for four years. He and, survived. Uh, All right, give him a round of applause. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Okay. So I, I, I do have an engineering background, so I, I can do that stuff too. But uh, I did go to arts high, and really, just the way Leah described it, I, I only I have to confess, I lived in New York City, Manhattan. The only reason I didn't go to another elite high school called Bronx Science mm -hmm. is because I would have had to take public transit for an hour and three quarters, mm -hmm. as opposed to walk 20 minutes to the school I went to, which was called Music and Art. And the enrichment, while I was initially disappointed at not getting into the science kind of school, uh, the enrichment was beyond belief in terms of everything, in terms of learning natural expression, but also the kinds of people who went to those schools. They're a little bit more bohemian, a little bit more interesting, came from a wider variety of backgrounds. I think there was greater diversity. So that education, I think, really helped. And I saw for myself the correlation that Leah described between math and uh, particularly music. I was in art. But uh, some of my friends who were in music were really good at math, which I was good at, so I knew them. And they would explain to me what Leah was saying about that connection. So to me, it was a very, a, a very good coincidence that my mother, it wasn't really me who chose it, my mother <laughs> happened to choose music and art. Thanks, Mom. And yeah. I, I, I had that background. OK. And I think that's an important point. And let me throw this out here, too. I think in looking at what uh, Seattle schools are doing and schools around the state in terms of these STEM programs, we've talked about them with science, technology, engineering, math. They're talking about throwing an A in there, trying to make it a STEAM program. And I, I'm seeing a few nodding heads that I don't know who wants to start with this, but let me know about this. Marcy, would you like to start? Well, I, I think it's a, a proposal by people in the arts, less than people in the engineering and math side of it. But I think there is a really strong connection, especially between science and art, because those are all about creative problem solving. And to me, um, kids that I see 
who, who are really like lab science oriented, they're thinking on the same kind of level as a painter or a sculptor or a choreographer who's making something. They have a question that they set out to try to answer and they're using the same kind of critical thinking processes. So I think it would be great. I know the state has, you know, its special ELERS for what, I don't know what that even stands for, but <laughs> you know, there's these, these things that you're supposed to be judged for for oh, the oh, arts, oh, yeah, but, the metrics but thing, it yeah. really is more, I think everybody's goal is, you know, I'm a parent, is to, to develop a kid who's, a, who's able to confront a problem and come up with good solutions to it. And whether that's moving people around a city or, mm -hmm. or designing a building, that you know is energy friendly and gorgeous mm -hmm. and adds to the the city infrastructure. So I, I don't know who's going to make that steam decision, but yeah. um, I look forward to the argument in the legislature yeah. when they get there. They've been doing plenty of that. Plenty yeah. of that. I I wanted to ask if there are any other questions out here quickly before, sir. Let me come your way here. David, go right ahead. Thanks. Uh, so here's a way of combining transportation with the arts. Um, and that is that our transportation system is very downtown-centric. It's a hub-and-spoke system. And our arts are very downtown-centric. It seems to me that a good way to enable arts to solve some of their financial problems and to deal with our wonderful neighborhoods is to have more neighborhood arts. And yet, efforts like Empty Space in Fremont, uh, have more or less not succeeded. So I wonder whether any of you have an idea, how could we get more happening in neighborhood arts and how, is, how much of that is a transportation problem? Fair question. Let's uh, start. Leah, did you have a thought there? I mean, there are certainly some positive bellwethers to, in that world. I mean, the art walks are a good example, I think. I mean, obviously, the Pioneer Square one is the big one, but the little ones that are in all kinds of other neighborhoods, I mean, there are new ones sprouting up all the time. And, and those are people really belonging to their neighborhoods and building community around the chance to mill about on that one night a month. Um, and, and that might be maybe a little bit easier to sustain as a starting point than a theater or something like that. Although to the empty space point, there's a theater in Fremont now and people go there but they might be coming from somewhere else. Mm, okay, and uh, Storefront Seattle, I know, is another big one that has worked out in the area. And Marcy, I know you've touched on this story. Tell us a little bit about that program. I don't know if everybody knows about it well, and, and what it can mean Shun for Pike arts program. in the area. Right? No, I'll go for it. <laughs> yeah. We're just talking, Leah helped found Shunpike. Um, that's a program that was a brilliant idea, which was to um, use, after the Great Recession, all those empty commercial buildings in, in business districts, particularly downtown and the ID in Pioneer Square, to sort of marry the unaffordability of arts stu studio space and art presentation space with some of these empty storefronts. It helps revitalize neighborhoods. I think it was a brilliant idea. Um, it's limited. Well, actually, just moved to Mount Vernon, which I think is really cool. but. In terms of, of bringing things to different neighborhoods, I know Charlie Rathbun at For Culture has focused a lot on, on sort of diluting the, the downtown-centric nature of, of art. It's hard. I mean, if we're talking about performing arts, it needs to be an affordable space that's big enough for people. Maybe zoning is, I mean, there are, we're talking about transit-oriented development mm -hmm. in the city of Seattle, maybe the, uh, to revive uh, the the neighborhood like the Pike Pine Corridor that's got a special arts zoning overlay the cultural overlay district Kodak plans so that we have art spaces that are built in like 12th Avenue Arts on in the Pike Pine Corridor that's going to have performance spaces commercial spaces residential spaces I think that that zoning is one way to address okay. that Peter uh, before I'm going to get to your question in just a second but Peter let me draw you in here I, I, tell us about that trying to make these connections uh, between centers for art and using transit, transportation to do that. I think one of the big issues here, it almost turns into a social justice issue, being able to access these different spots here. Let me know your concerns about that because I think that's a big issue all around Seattle. So in social justice, uh, a, a core principle of all of our transportation projects in the city is in fact uh, being able to go everywhere and it not be just uh, Seattle uh, downtown centric and, and so on. So uh, the, the way we select projects, whether it be uh, curb bulbs at intersections, sidewalks, or whatever, we really pay a lot of attention to uh, distributing it fairly. 
the arts angle is interesting because uh, the one percent for art probably draws a disproportionate amount of money from the mega projects. And uh, frankly, to be honest with you, I can I can tell you all about the art that we've put in over the years uh, in SDOT. And when I think of it quickly, a lot of it is uh, near the big project. So uh, uh, Mercer has a sculpture that you can see in the median. Uh, Spokane uh, Street Viaduct that we've just finished has the painted columns. But they're not in the neighborhoods to the same extent. And I don't know if anything prevents us from looking at our overall program and the 1% and then saying that instead of concentrating it where the projects were, saying, no, let's spread it out. Let's enhance other programs. Let's, it, because the community experience is probably one of the most important things about the art in this context. Okay. It's, it's, it's everything, really. And the community is everywhere. It, it is downtown, too, but it's everywhere else. And okay. I think we ought to look at that. Fair enough. Uh, Mary? Can I, yeah. can I, I, I was Please. going to take issue with the question. OK. Uh, I do think that there's quite a It's almost a like huge... these two work together or something. OK, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's, there's a lot of um, you know, large arts organizations that are concentrated downtown, a lot of large performance spaces. But you know, I mean, there's a lot of individual artists who are all over the place. I mean, mm. they're all over Georgetown. They're all over the International District. They're in Wallingford. And I, I would kind of throw it out to the artists in the, in the, in the audience. I mean, do, do you think that that's true, that, that the arts is concentrated downtown and that its ability, like the great diaspora, cannot happen or would be facilitated maybe by transportation, but really isn't happening without some sort of an impetus like that. You call for an artist and I give you Jay. Jay. Yeah. <laughs> Who's not only a metro driver, but a composer. OK. okay. So <clears throat> All right. I get both. You win. You win. Yeah. 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 I get the prize. OK. So um, first thing is, is like, if I want to go to a concert, which I do occasionally, I can't get there. Because if I get there, getting back, it's, I mean, it's going to take me three hours to get back. Using public transportation is of what course. you're saying. Yeah. yeah, and I drive for them, so I know how to get there. Right, right. OK. You know the routes. OK. I know the routes. It's all coming so, clear. So I mean, uh -huh. it's been 33 years. I should know some of the routes. Uh-huh. So, so you know, even, and I live in the south end, which means I'm in the desert. I can't even get to Columbia City, which is not becoming a desert. It's actually starting to open up. But I can't get there and get back in a reasonable time. That's all I have really Okay, to say. fair Jay, enough. Jay, car. thank you for that. You need to get a car. Any, any, well, oh. let's, uh, let's see if we can. Would you mind? Let me, I'll come right over to you, sir. Stay seated, please. Okay. All right. Joaquin, what would you have to say? I'm just curious. It seems to me that a lot of the the art that is funded through the transportation projects is visual art. Is there a, a law that discusses how you would fund, for example, performing art, music art, and maybe in, in such a way where you don't have to buy the visual art, but probably fund a year's worth of performance for oh, music, yeah. for That's example? For culture, I actually <laughs> sat on a panel for audio art in the rapid ride, the A rapid ride. So. That was maybe a year and a half ago. So I think there is discussion in the agencies, in the public agencies. I don't know about in the city of Seattle, but at the county level, there, there is, you know, how, how can we do this? How are we going to use that money? I think, actually, also to Peter's point, I think, at least at the county level also, instead of a sculpture or a painting, we're talking about integrating artists into the actual designs of the project. Brightwater is, is a case in point where, where the artist can help not you know, put something on the front of it, but actually create a project that is maybe more aesthetically appealing, that fits better into its environment. And I think that that can be true even in, um, you know, I'm no road designer, but to make, to make a street along the waterfront that, that's something that I want to drive on because there's some kind of inherent experience. And I'd love to see more performance funding. I think it would be great. And by the way, yeah, to please. Uh, reinforce that, uh, the waterfront plan that the city has been involved in uh, for the last, it's, I think it's over three years now, yeah. uh, is going to have a really strong arts element, exactly for the reasons Marcy just said. And art will be integrated into the project uh, in all sorts of ways, wh whether it's the surface you walk on, whether it's sculpture. Uh, I think we'll be working with the tribes, reflecting the history. So all of that is, is meant to, it's not going to be just the park with sculpture plopped in. 
it'll be part of it, just, just the way Marcy described it. Does anybody it. know, though, this is such a good question, uh, what percentage of the 1% for art art is non-visual art? Ooh, great question. Say Peter? that three times fast. Yeah. How much would would, would Chuck Chuck? I, do, I mean, you, do you know what it is, Peter, or is that? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, Marianne might know. Marianne I don't have know? the ordinance Marianne in front of me, know. but I believe the way the ordinance is written, the one percent for art, and the way our uh, transportation arts program is, it is largely visual. I don't know if therefore you cannot change it. Right. But it has been that way, and okay. we can certainly look and. Uh, Randy or Ruri? We're gonna Ruri. we're gonna get Randy in just a second. Yeah. Know that. We got we got a lot of experts to talk with here. Did you did you have a comment that you wanted to throw I in there? I think you should Ruri. let Ruri. Ladies first, ladies first. Because no, my Ruri. comment is is not gonna be very supportive of this conversation. Uh, there's all kinds of comments. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Did you want to say um, something? I, I was just thinking to myself, I think it's just incredible that we're still having the same questions about the arts in 2013 in this particular region. As a practicing artist, I'm well aware that my activity as an artist is a marginalized position in the mindset of most people. And the real issue is changing that mindset. And frankly, everybody in this room in some facet of their day, every day, runs into some contribution by an artist. Every time you turn on your com computer, pick up a book, listen to the radio, there's no way that you can escape the fact that the arts are integrated into your daily life. And so the real issue for all of us is a community mindset, a reset which says that the arts are not marginalized. They are integrated, and they're in our life every single day. OK, thank you for that comment. And I think uh, there's a lady here who's been waiting very patiently. I am going to try to talk to some more folks here in just a second. Lisa, you had something to say? Go yes, right ahead. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the storefront project. I, I'm an artist part of an integrated a uh, troop called the Ice Queens, and we make these giant recycled material gowns, so it's part performance art, part sculpture, and we had the luck to be able to display our pieces in the International District, so I just wanted to um, recognize Marcy for bringing that project up and talk about that, but also um, back to civic leadership and promoting arts in education mm -hmm. for children. Um, I'm a member of the Seattle uh, chapter of the Junior League, and we have a project called Northwest Art. And we have a collection of Northwest artists, local artists. And we bring uh, our pieces to underfunded schools in our region who don't have the transportation or the access to be up close and engage in, an, in a structured way and learn how to do that critical thinking piece. Um, in a guided discussion, and we impact over 10,000 children each year. Wow. And I just wanted to um, highlight this effort because sometimes it's difficult to know who else has the same interest. How can we connect, and how can we develop some synergy since we're all working toward the same goal? Um, so if anyone's interested, we're the Junior League of Seattle, okay. and we also are a training organization for women to develop <coughs> skills for civic leadership. So if you're a woman interested in, in civics and leadership, okay. Junior League of Seattle. OK. This message brought to you by Lisa. Thank you very much for that. If you'd like to talk to her, you know where to find her afterwards. A few other questions. Uh, Paul, you had one. I'm going to try to get out of your way so we can see her. I'll hold the mic. Go that's, right that's ahead. That's great. Um, I'm going to kind of take it in a different direction. Go for it. Um, not to be obstinate or anything, but no. we're not an island onto ourselves. I mean, Western rugged individualism is known throughout the West. Um, this is a, a sort of a nexus of bringing transportation and art uh, in a more regional scale. Uh, we talked about Metro and their cuts and Metro, 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 but what if we formed an interregional transportation uh, authority similar to what other cities have done? So mm. we might be able to uh, expand service and expand, uh, shall we say, the wealth uh, that other uh, companies, I mean, people have worked on this and it, it, it's very popular in Chicago and even Portland. Okay. Um, and as far as the arts go, and, and that's that's the weave of this, uh, there's a lot going on in other cities, suburban cities, as far as arts, like storefronts. They've emulated a lot of what we've done, what they've done in New York City. And so in, in order to maybe work collectively as a region, more of a holistic way of looking at things, we might want to consider blending both of those together, an interregional transportation authority and bringing in uh, artists from other parts of the region and us going out there and somehow forming more of an artistic region and a more transportation. I mean, it's, 
I, just a thought. Yeah, no, I hear you there. And Mary, I want to have you uh, jump in on this one and talk about this because I know Doug McDonald was recently writing in Crosscut about this whole concept, believe it or not. Well, let's about not this. Who was editing? Yeah, I know, and I, I think I, I think I think it's interesting it's not to. Not just uh, the writer. You know, no, 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 no. no. I, I I think uh, I think in looking at this, he was bringing up this idea of all these different uh, interagency agencies and whatever else, and the need to simplify that. I, I hear what's being said here, but let me know about this. This whole idea of trying to simplify the connections or maybe lack of connections we have between different uh, transportation agencies mm -hmm. in our region. You know, I, I think that that's a, that, uh, that's a problem everywhere today. Yeah. That, you know, it, there was a time that, and it's fast ending, where everything was about specialization. So everybody was in their little silo, you know, and that was fine. But now the problems that we confront, not just with transportation, with everything, they're so complex that people, it, all the answers are, multidisciplinary and people really need to get out of their silos and start talking to each other and you know to go back to what Marcy was saying before I think that's the one like a really amazing thing about artists in general is they think they don't think with boundaries you know their their boundaries are completely porous they don't really exist and so you know an artist might be able to problem solve in, in a technological environment as easily as they can problem solve in an architectural environment because that's just the way they think so with the transit system you know, it's futile. Mm. There's the state, there's the county, there's the city, there's the other cities. But to, is it Paul? Yes. Yeah, to Paul's point, the, the, the system that we're building is huge. It's, it's countywide, it's statewide, it's actually international, really, because, I mean, there's a lot of products that we have to, in terms of freight, get oh, yeah. from, you know, interior Washington to the coast and then to China or wherever we're going to send it. Mm -hmm. so, so having those little silos and having everybody whose egos are invested in, you know, maintaining that, that center of power is, is, a handy, is a huge handicap, okay. a social, political, cultural handicap that we, ha that we have to get over. I recommend complete anarchy. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Answer, Brian. Great idea. Okay. <laughs> Super. Uh, Peter, let me draw you. I, I, I heard one piece there. This whole idea of connecting these agencies is futile. And I don't know if you agree with that. What do you think? Yeah, in fact, I, I, I wasn't sure whether you would say feudal or Oh, with an F-E. Uh, well either, well well either one well applies, doesn't it? That's your either line. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's a topic that's been around a, a, a very long time. Um, uh, a lot of truth in it. As an example, and I don't remember if Paul is from Everett, but Everett has its own transit system. No, I'm not. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, up north is a city of 100,000 that has its own transit system, surrounded by a county that has something called community transit. And over the years, they've managed to fend off very logical ideas like you just heard expressed. <laughs> so um, you look at our region overall, and it, it is often confusing. Uh, there are a lot of problems with that. It's probably not just only in our area. Uh, there are probably any number of things that can work better if we uh, are regional. But just thinking about the question, I, while transportation might work better regionally, I, it's funny. I don't think of art that way. Mm -hmm. I think of art as maybe the funding and that part of it. But I think of art as individual, at least certain kinds of art. Other arts are more collective. But they're not on a regional level. They're community level, a neighborhood level. Um, so I don't know if I buy that paradigm of both being regional entities. OK. But, but there is a proposal Mars. that's been um, under development and, and sort of bandied about at the legislative level to have at least, and David Brewster can probably correct me, tri-county tax that would fund culture, tri-county, okay. and, and that needs to go to the legislature. And with getting the four culture hotel motel tax sort of instituted, that yeah. had priority. So I think this cultural development authority idea will reemerge, and that would be I believe a sales tax that would, and I don't know what percentage. Yeah. And I don't know if it's happening in this budget session no, either. There's not a lot, happen of, this year, I don't a lot of things happening in Olympia but, right yeah. now. I, I want to throw out another question here that we did just get in via Twitter. I finally figured out how to work my iPad here. Uh, Jamila sent in a, a question via Twitter. Seattle Public Schools have limited school busing and choice. How do we ensure that kids have equal access to art in schools? I think this is another one of those uh, social justice types of issues here. Leah, do you want to take a stab at this one? Sure. This was one of the most interesting things I learned when I really dove into what the schools are working on because, of course, you know, being an arts person, I wasn't paying super close attention to the um, change in the schools over the last couple of years where kids have to actually go to their neighborhood school and go through the process and you don't get to choose anymore. And 
I don't have a kid, so I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that. And lo and behold, come into this arts world and realize that this is the way to actually make sure that kids are getting the equal arts education from start to finish because it changes the way that the schools are accountable starting from elementary school through to middle school they can actually follow a kid along the way whereas before you would just be like oh you know we're a theater family we're really into theater we're going to find the theater school and we're going to get our kid all the way across town because we can do that and that's not fair and that's not going to promote equity for people who don't have those kinds of maybe even just knowledge resources not to mention you know the rest of the resources that are involved in making that happen not to mention the PTA that makes that program pro possible etc 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 so even though a lot of people have been grumpy about this no more choose your school situation um, it's actually a really good thing for something like arts education okay and I want to draw in another person who I just happened to see in the crowd here Randy Engstrom would you mind jumping around here sir Give Randy a big round of applause. He, of course, yeah, from our uh, Seattle Department of uh, Arts and Cultural Affairs. I finally got that right. Uh, Randy, tell us a little bit about this. I want to talk about arts in our schools because I know a uh, big program jumping off here. All these different schools are going to have arts, but I didn't get that extra grant money. I think they needed a million additional dollars to really implement it. Can you help us just with that challenge there of trying to find that extra money? How are they going to be able to do something like that? Is the area that we're in right now is the, I don't know, is, is it the right time for that? Is there ever a right time for that, I guess? Uh, tell us about that challenge in trying to find the funding for programs like this. Sure, well, I'll try to stitch together uh, Jamila's question and um, and what the artist was saying who feels underappreciated mm. in Seattle. We've pretty much stopped funding arts education in any sort of consistent, coherent way for the last 30 years. Mm. And when you're wondering why it's hard to find audiences of the future, mm. why people don't appreciate art, why it's hard to find creative people and we have all these vacant jobs in the tech sector, I, th I think part of that is because we've pulled the innovation out of our educational system. Mm -hmm. The plan that we have in place is grounded in two principles. Um, so just so you know, the school district, about 2,000 partners in the community, parents, arts educators, teachers, principals, came together and created a plan of how to bring arts education back into the district. It. Um, it's for two reasons. One is the social justice issue. You can predict by race a kid's access to arts education in Seattle public schools, period. And that's not okay. And the other is an economic development issue. If we don't teach creativity, innovation, creative habits of mind, persistence, collaboration, where are the software developers, the app, de the app developers, the entrepreneurs, the Tom Douglases, the Peter Hans of the future are going to come from if we're not training creative thinkers of the future? The plan does three things. It institutionalizes arts education as a, a core part of the curriculum, which by law it already is, but by practice it is not at the district level. Uh, it aligns the work, to Leah's point, about kindergarten through 12th grade, consistent pathways, all the principals together, creating a pathway, a continuum for every student. So all 48,000 kids get access to two hours of arts education every week, K through 12. Doesn't matter what school, doesn't matter what neighborhood or how strong the PTA is. Um, and, and the last is that we have an incredible wealth of cultural organizations, nonprofit partners, including uh, the Junior League and others, who are offering this work in partnership with schools. If we can align that work, if we can leverage the incredible contribution our community is already making so that the school district, the principals, and the arts education organizations are pointed at the same goal, then we can actually move the needle on how arts education gets funded. We can get access to families and education money, which right now arts education doesn't. We can get access to OSPI money at the state level, which right now arts education doesn't. And we can transform education in Seattle. Wow. Randy, thank you very much. Great points raised by Randy Enchim there. Thank you very much. Folks, I wanted to make sure, uh, before I grab another comment uh, about what's happening with, with art, I want to make sure that we cover any of the big transportation questions you have out there. We've got a 520 bridge with some bad pontoons. We've got some <laughs> I-90 bridge ideas here about tolling it. Anybody have some comments in terms of what's happening? Uh, Ma'am, did you have a, a thought there? Please, go ahead. I'm not sure it's about a specific project, but this is a question for Peter. I was, I, I was thinking about your comment about artists don't think in a regional way, but I know lots of artists work on a county scale, a city scale, project scale, and even, you know, at a, at a you know, thinking about um, sort of Artists made building parts, you know, so artists are thinking in all kinds of scales. I was wondering, if, you know, be, given your arts background, if there were no rules, no constraints, how would you see artists thinking about transportation in a, in a comprehensive way at all kinds of scales? 
Go ahead. Peter. What, could, yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I, first of all, I like to I yeah. like to think that the program that we have uh, fosters that kind of creativity and allows it to shine through our projects. So when I look at boring columns that hold up a roadway under Spokane, and I see the art on that, it's it's really inspiring. I mean, it's like. I, I was a little bit surprised when I first saw it, and then I saw the continuity of it. So it, it's 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 several blocks long, and so I'd like to think that that is uh, how we choose our art, and we have an elaborate process where we call for projects. And I think the idea is to generate the best thinking and to give people a good shot at competing uh, for getting the money and the one percent for art. So. If, if there were no constraints, I don't know if that would mean if there's even more money. Of <laughs> and, um, and so, sure, and then it would be, maybe we should go to 2% for art at some point, which again, sounds trivial and small, but uh, th th that's one of the things holding us back. But I like to think that because of our strong partnership with the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, that we, we, we jointly fund a position, that we really try to bring that in as much as possible through the people who are seated over there, Randy and Ruri. So that's that's what I would say. Well, what about I, asking artists in to be more involved in actually designing the transportation system itself, or thinking about ways to move people, not just you know making it look nice or or be aesthetically approachable, but how we move people around the city. I mean, artists are really great problem solvers. So isn't there some way? I mean, I know there was a period of time in the city where there were artists in um, Seattle Public Utilities and artists in, in the um, you know various departments and right. yeah, yeah in yeah. residence. So yeah. I'm pretty sure that the transportation department probably had an artist as well. I mean, just have them sit in on these planning meetings, and yes, it's, and it's so interesting too yeah. now because there's a lot of I mean the idea of group sourcing a, a solution is really you know it's just kind of infused in our way of thinking and. So to invite a team of, and it may, maybe it's not just artists, but it's a, an interdisciplinary team to just kind of think creatively about a particular project that, uh, I don't know, the engineers are having a tough time solving. Uh, what would be, a, if nothing else, it would probably be a fun experience. And, and a lot of interesting <laughs> ideas would happen. I mean, at Crosscut, we've been talking a lot about how to cover the arts in a different way. And, uh, and, and one of the things we've talked about is instead of uh, just writing about the arts, maybe it, what would be more interesting is to invite artists into our process. So mm -hmm. what, what would it be like for an artist to cover the state legislature? Or what would it be like for a group of artists to talk about, you know, like the transportation, the, the 520 bridge project? And so, so kind of invite that kind of thinking into, uh, you know, we like to call it casting against type. Sure. You know? yeah. yeah, I could see that's a really bad Jackson Pollock painting. But first, I want to I want to draw in. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to get to you in just a second. Young lady standing up right here with a question, if I may. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, so uh, we're all being so polite and so nice, and you know, it's kind of getting to me. So, um, so, so here's my question. Um, what I know about Seattle is that Seattle's an insider town. You get access to things because you know who you know. So when I hear you all talk about uh, regional funding for the arts, I have to tell you, total panic sets in. Because, you know, I'm an introvert. There are only so many people I really want to know. So the idea of having to stretch myself that far to know that many people to get access to resources to do what I want to do, that's a little much. So I just wanted to throw that out there and see if anybody had anything to say about it. OK. Lola, yeah, thank mean, you very much. It's Leah. an interesting question. I mean, why should every artist have to be a fundraiser, right? Even if in the world of Kickstarter and all of that, I mean, Number one, those are great and flawed options, but you're still the artist stuck with fundraising in those kinds of situations. And what I wonder about all the time is like, given the spirit of philanthropy that exists in this region, and even given the kind of pioneering efforts of some of the philanthropy that was going on in the early 1980s in town, um, why can't this be the place where we kind of reinvent a Medici-style um, benefactor approach? You know, why can't there be individual relationships between people who care about and support the arts with artists, where you don't have to make an entire extra job out of putting your project together, sure. or you don't have to convince a producer to be your middleman or have 16 nonprofits? And you know, it gets ridiculous. And it, it, why kind of boils down to the do we value the arts on a big enough fundamental enough level that people will even 
think that that is okay, that it's not somehow a frivolous way to spend their money when what better thing can they really spend it on? <laughs> Actually, ACT Theater, you can commission a playwright through ACT Theater, right. and one of the mayoral candidates uh, is is somebody who commissions and pays for artwork. So Yeah, that's a really it, cool program. Yes, and, yeah. and so that does exist. The symphony has done the same thing. It's pretty expensive, but I, I agree. And there are some Medici's in this town. Okay. I, I have a question from Steve here. You've been waiting patiently. Go ahead, Thank sir. You. Um, this is a maybe a paradigm shifter about this issue about arts and education. I'm a current uh, public school administrator, former teacher back in the day in the 70s at a school here in Seattle. I taught. Uh, visual art, I taught dance, and with due respect to everyone in the arts community, the conversation around here has not really changed in a long, long, long time. So in the spirit of Ken Robinson, though, Sir Ken Robinson, those of you who know it, I would say to suggest the elephant of the room is not arts. Arts will not leverage education. The issue of creativity will. It cuts across all, uh, across all curriculum. It's a kind of subterranean, but, uh, subterranean but sort of vital movement. And when that starts to poke its way into the sciences, into social sciences, into com learning about computers, then we're going to see the kind of shift I think is in the heart of everybody here. So I'd like to su suggest that, that, that that conversation shift or that paradigm get more into what creativity means in all the other areas where kids, for your very example, are dying to express themselves through some other way through their writing, not just through their, their visual art or not just through music, in science, in experimentation, in project-based learning. This is where the action is. It's happening, but it has not been blown up in a proportion where we're really seeing our shift out of this sort of standards movement into the era of creativity as here, but I encourage you to get your response around that new framework for how education is going to change. Wow. Thanks very much for that, Steve. I'm, hold that thought. I want you to think about that for a minute because we have a number of different comments I want to make sure that we get to here while we still have time. One comment here, Steve wrote this in. Interesting way to change the conversation here. One percent for art is a wonderful thing, but there are more important things. Even more important than transportation infrastructure, green infrastructure, and the fact invasive ivy is strangling our city forests and holly outnumbers native trees nine to one and is doubling every eight years. How about one percent for nature? Even half a percent. So one point to raise there. A few people uh, smiling on that one. Uh, Peter, let me throw one your way. I think this is directed specifically to SDOT. Are there ways the Seattle Department of Transportation can use art as traffic calming measures? Any thought to that there? Holly, did you put that in? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It's it's somebody. Um, yes, I think there are. I think that um, there are even examples, and I don't remember the exact uh, intersection, where a traffic circle had been painted in. And uh, I think uh, you have to weigh the attractiveness of the art from adding to our distraction, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have a balance where the, the art uh, gets you into a slowing experience, which is good, but not also an inattentiveness to other things experience. So you have to figure out how to do it, uh, no pun intended, artfully. Yeah. And I think, you, you, so you have to be careful in how you do it because I think that's a great principle of, of our problems or, or undercard is the distraction, the, the cell phones, the texting, the talking, the make, whatever you do. Uh, so that it, it's not as simple as that. But I think it adds to the enrichment of our streets. And quick uh, question I thought I'd, Okay. Let me, let, me throw, let me throw a quick question in here. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, one question Marcy had about specifically with transportation. How are we going to solve the Washington State Ferries funding issue? Boy, that's a big one. I know it's not exactly your area of expertise, Peter. I know also the State Senate in putting together their package looks like they're going to fund ferries, but long term, that, that's a big, big question for a lot of people who use that service. Uh, I don't have any great insight, and I know some of your correspondents have tremendous insights, so I look forward to Doug's okay. uh, treatment of that story. I know Crosscut's been dealing with this quite a bit. Mary, did you have yeah. something to talk about? Well, about I, this? I live on Vashon, so yeah. we're, we're going to turn the entire site into ferry.com <laughs> okay. ve very soon. And no, I, I, wish, I wish I had something really helpful to say here. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sort of an example of the transportation system in general is there's not a dedicated source of funding that's big enough to even deal with the, the maintenance problems that we have, which are pretty, yeah. pretty substantial, let alone long-term planning. Well, let me throw in another question uh, that did come from our audience about transportation. There's been no short of attention, shortage of attention on transportation and a transportation package in the Olympia this year. In an ideal world, what would that package look like to you and how might that incorporate art, 
to create vibrant, livable, connected communities. A thought out there. Uh, any thoughts on that piece of it? Wow. That That's larger awesome. picture of that, uh, that transportation package that our state's trying to put together. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that Doug talks about in his story uh, about that particular transportation package is that there's a lot of money being uh, allocated for big new projects. And based on his analysis, that's sort of the last thing that we need because we really can't even support and maintain the projects that we already have or the, the roadways, the bridges that we already have. So um, I don't know how you get uh, people to uh, us to think long term. Um, you know, we're, we're very, it, whenever I see like a cathedral, I always think, you see now, we, we can think long term because the people that built that cathedral, I mean, <laughs> they didn't, it didn't get built in their lifetimes. It didn't even get built in their grandchildren's lifetimes, but they right. kept putting the bricks on the bricks, you know? Okay. And that's what we need to do. I mean, we need to recognize that we're going to have to decide about a dedicated source of funding and it's going to take... 30, 40, 50 years before we A, like, you know, create the, uh, 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 or maintain the system that we currently have and build something that's going to sustain us into the future. And we've got to make the commitment. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm just not sure how you convince people that this is so Brian, the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah please. So I have a lot of confidence in our city and our citizens. And I think if we were given the tools to ask our citizens on how to fund transportation, what to fund, how to incorporate art, how to in incorporate uh, green infrastructure, our citizens, I think, would, would step up, and transit being the best example. Yeah. I think, just like in 2006, when citizens uh, uh, supported transit now, which was the last increase for Metro, I'm confident that if we were given that tool, people in this city would absolutely and overwhelmingly support uh, transit. They would support the kinds of projects uh, that we want to see. and. Uh, so that would, and, and it amazes me that there's still a reluctance to give our governing people mm. or our people, never yeah. mind our, our city legislature or our citizens, the ability to try that out yeah. and ask the people mm -hmm. and, and, and make a compelling case. That's what's happening in our state senate right now. The package that they've put together does not include a provision that would allow cities or counties to make that funding type of choice and ask for that uh, that piece right there. Let me throw a few more questions. We have just a couple more minutes here. So any other comments in the audience real quick while I have you here? Let's make sure we do this as I juggle my way your way. Marielle, would you mind standing up and coming out in the aisle here? Sure. Thanks. Please go ahead. Seattle is a hub of technology, and you artists need to go to the University of Washington Bothell, where they have this, the uh, the DigiPen. All these different universities that combine art and technology, those guys are making lots of money on their games. Start going to them to have you have fund art because they all have a basis of art. Okay, all right, threw that out there. A couple more pieces here. Oh, there's a young lady. Come this way just a little further. Let's see that. That beautiful uh, red hair. There oh, she is. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I moved here in 1992, and at that time, Seattle was second to New York in the number of live theater performances. And I'd like to hear you discuss the performing arts. Um, uh, you mentioned the ACT Theater. Full disclosure, um, I'm on the board of ACT. We have uh, the uh, Central Heating Lab, which nourishes all young theater companies, and it's a 24-hour performing arts center in effect. But it's a lot of work, and we're the only ones that I know of that are doing this. And Marcy mentioned commissioning new works. But in general, the performing artists, uh, I may have more of a difficult time than individual artists, because you can at least create on your own. But performing artists usually need to work with a group. So okay. can you make a comment to that, please? Please. Anyone have a <laughs> thought on that one? Marcy, I, tough, tough um, one, I know. It's since I, and I've been here longer than since 1992. <laughs> Um, one thing that we've seen with the performing arts organizations is the disappearance of the mid-level um, theater companies in particular, um, but also dance companies. It's been really hard, um, as you mentioned, if you're really young and really eager, you're happy to sleep on the couch and eat ramen for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you want to have a kid or maybe you decide that you need health insurance or if you're a dancer, your knees and hips go, and, and you, you need something else. So what we've seen are theaters like the empty space um, fold over the years. And there hasn't, right now, I think the biggest problem is how you bridge. There's, there's artists who've made that leap to the big houses, and they're at ACT and the rep, mm -hmm. and not at Intamon anymore. You know That mm -hmm. may revive. We'll see. So there aren't a lot of jobs. Those people leave. and so. 
I, I would say, in particular, the, the theater community, there's so many people that come here, they can't stay here. There are people who have been here for a long time. They find work, but, but people in their 30s and 40s tend to leave, and yeah. that's not a great thing. No, no, Although it's not. Although on the I positive side of that, there, there, there is, even though the, the middle has question. dropped out in theater, especially over the last you know, handful of years, in the last maybe two years, there have been positive signs. Some of the fringier companies have been developing to a point where they might soon be considered seriously mid-sized. And that starts to make that ecosystem healthier again so that artists can continue to pursue their craft and can stay in town. And you know, one thing that I'm always harping on about is the idea that we don't want to just make our artists grow and strong and incubate them and then pass them away. Our great assets, these creative minds, these wonderful genius people, and then they have a certain amount of success and we don't have room for them anymore. That's, that's a, a crime. So, you know, filling in that ecosystem is essential and, and you know, something like, like ACT's uh, Heating Lab is a great program, but there are lots of other things too, like 12th Avenue Arts, et cetera. Okay, a lot of great comments here, folks. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up Civic Cocktail. Can we give a big round of applause to our panelists here, folks? Thank you. Thank you once again. And of course, a huge thanks to the Whitman Institute for making this show possible. Thanks, of course, to our partners at City Club and Crosscut, and of course, Tom Douglas and the Palace Ballroom. I want to point out, we will be here on the first Wednesday of next month, too, so we want you to get involved. For more information, check out seattlechannel.org. You'll see links to City Club and Crosscut and get all the details you want there. We could not have done it without a great audience. Give yourselves a round of applause, folks. Did a great job. Great, great questions this evening. I want to make sure that everyone gets home safely. And remember, you're watching the show that's the toast of to the town, Civic Cocktail. We'll see you next time. <laughs>